of trading. Take one. Let's face it, it's the wild, wild west out there on social media. You got all these exercise gurus and influencers and content creators and complete charlatans and they're all out there dueling and battling it out as to which exercises are great and which exercises are not so great. And for the record, I don't understand how people bash exercises. Exercises are good. To me, if you bash an exercise, it shows that you're not a real trainer. It shows that you're one of those guys who sits behind a computer and makes stuff up. Because any real trainer, they love exercise variations. I'm friends with all these real trainers that own gyms and train real people in real life. We love all the exercises. We're always interested in new variations. Those of us who write programs for lots of people you got to keep it interesting. It's like this, okay? Think of a carpenter, all right? A good carpenter is going to have a ton of tools, right? Now, on their tool belt, they'll have the hammer and the screwdriver and these tools that they use very often. Those might be your squats, your bench press, your hip thrusts, you know, your chin-ups. But that carpenter will also have a ton of specialty tools, right? As a trainer, these are your dual elevated single leg hip thrust and your kneeling cable kickback and your knee banded eccentric accentuated hip thrust. You know, those aren't your big rocks, but you're going to use them throughout the year a lot. Same with the carpenter. He's going to need some specialty saw or sander or something like that throughout the year to complete the job. You'd never see a good carpenter bashing tools. You'd never see a good carpenter be like, the hammer is stupid. So to me, when a fitness person bashes an exercise, they're giving it away. They're a phony. They're a fraud. They're a charlatan. They don't really train people. They spend their whole day on social media making things up. For this reason, I created an exercise efficiency guide. I wanted to do this for myself because it's good to categorize things and form a model, but I especially did this for you. I want you guys to be able to analyze exercise and form your own opinion and especially not be fooled by these idiots out there that make up their own bio mechanics. So how do we know if an exercise is effective? Well, there are different types of clues. In my guide, I've broken it down into three categories of clues, all right? Now, each of these clues provide one piece to the puzzle, but these pieces formulate the puzzle and they're all important. All of the pieces have flaws and limitations, all right? Used to be the EMG was all that, and lately it's been criticized, people pointing out its limitations, but everything on this list has its limitations. You know, musculoskeletal modeling has its limitations. Muscle soreness has its limitations. All of the clues have limitations, which is why we need to rely on multiple cues and lots of data points to help us home in on the truth. But no logical person would ever just choose one or two puzzle pieces. And you see that out there. You see some of these gurus only relying on functional anatomy or only relying on EMG or only relying on the feel. They really should be taking everything into consideration and never ignoring any puzzle pieces. So back to this guide. The first category is common sense clues. Now these are the most popular clues because they don't require technology. Everyone out there can do an exercise and judge how it feels. You can pay attention to sensations like soreness or the pump or the burn. Everyone out there can analyze functional anatomy and be like, okay, here are the lines of the pecs. It makes sense that they do this. Now, the second category is numerical clues. These are great because they provide numerical data. The feel is all just subjective. It's like, I feel this working well, but how do you know if an easy bar curl compared to a preacher curl compared to concentration curl, you feel all of them working your biceps very well. So how can we differentiate those exercises and really examine how they differ and how they might be beneficial? But these clues require technology. They are mostly utilized by sports scientists who have the necessary equipment to obtain this data. Now this brings us to the final category, longitudinal clues. Now longitudinal clues are awesome, but they are the most uncommon due to the time requirements, you know? An everyday coach or trainer can't carry out a longitudinal study. They don't have the equipment, they don't have the people, they don't have the time. The people carrying out longitudinal research are mainly research professors. Typical semester is 16 weeks long. If you have a 12-week training study, this takes up the whole semester because you have to prepare for the study, carry out the study, and then analyze all the data. There are a lot more dropouts with longitudinal studies, so these are more rare and less common. Common sense and numerical clues, they lead to the generation of hypotheses and the formation of theories. But longitudinal research tests those hypotheses and theories. And in a perfect world, experiments would match the theories. They'd go hand in hand. That doesn't always happen. Now, in a perfect world, we would have hundreds of randomized controlled trials, hundreds of longitudinal studies, training studies, testing out every single exercise, you know? Every exercise, the step up, the push up, the inverted row, they would all have a hundred different training studies on different populations, looking at beginners, advanced, 
you know, young, old, underweight, overweight, newbies, advanced, males, females. There'd be studies on all the different variations of that exercise, you know, looking at different program design variables, like different volumes and frequencies. And you'd have so many studies that it would warrant review papers, you know, like authors need to take a look at all the studies and summarize them because there's so much to look at. Now, unfortunately, this is not the case in strength training research. It will never be the case. 300 years from now, it won't be the case because we don't have the funding that other fields have. And again, longitudinal research is very time consuming. It's very expensive. Whereas mechanistic data that provides numerical clues, those might just take you a weekend to obtain the data. You might be able to get everything you need for that study in two sessions. So our field will always be limited by longitudinal data. So in the absence of training studies, we have to rely more on the common sense and numerical clues. That's why all of these puzzle pieces fit together, and then we update our beliefs as we gain more knowledge over time. That's the essence of science. And the best exercise for me might not be the best exercise for you. We all have different anatomies, different physiologies, different psychologies, different injury risks, different fears, different experiences, different preferences. And that's why each of these clues have an individual component to them, but there's also an average component, like what's best for the masses, versus what's best per individual. And that's why you really need to pay attention to these clues for yourself so that you can determine your best exercises. So let's dive right into the guide. Looking at the guide, you see common sense clues. Feel, sensation, you know, perform a fly, all right? Where do you feel the stretch? Where do you feel the muscle working? Do you feel it in the pecs? That's what that means. Burn, all right? Do a set with really high reps and feel, where do you feel the burn? If I do a high rep set of curls, my biceps will be burning. Right? Do a bunch of sets with limited rest periods and you'll get a pump. Where do you get a pump? You know, if you do a bunch of sets of hip thrust, do you get a pump in your glutes? If so, it's probably a good glute exercise. DOMS, that stands for delayed onset muscle soreness. Do a bunch of sets of an exercise and then pay attention to where you feel sore the next day or the day after. Tension, okay, how can we estimate tension? Well, there's visual and there's palpation, all right? If I'm doing a leg extension and you see my quads contracting, you see all the striations coming out of my quads and it's probably a good quad exercise. Sometimes you can see people wearing leggings, you see their glutes contract inside the leggings. You can tell it's a good glute exercise, but even more so if you palpate. Now you can palpate yourself or you can palpate other people while they're doing the lift and you can feel for yourself how much tension is being generated. Is, is the muscle getting rock hard? If so, it's probably a good, good exercise for that muscle. Functional anatomy, you know, these are your, your joint actions and your fiber directions, right? You know, if you look at the biceps and you picture the biceps pulling together, it's gonna raise the arm, right? That's what it would do. If you look at the lines of the pecs, you can probably see that if you wanna work the bulk of the pec fibers, you should probably be out here in the, in the horizontal plane. Now, this doesn't always apply, but sometimes you can just look at the physiques of lifters who, who prioritize a lift. For example, Olympic weightlifters, right? They're always doing deep squats. They're doing deep high bar back squats and they're doing deep front squats. Olympic weightlifters have big quad development and the squat is their main exercise. It's not far-fetched to assume the squat is good for the quads. And finally, discussions with other lifters, coaches, trainers. You, know, you might not like a certain exercise, it's important to work with other people, train other people and work with other people so that you can see how other people react because they have different anatomies and physiologies. Now we're moving on to numerical clues. All right, there's EMG, that stands for electromyography. There's wire and surface EMG. This tells you the level of muscle activation. There's also functional MRI and this detects fluid shifts that are associated with metabolic activity. We got ultrasound, which you can use to look at like cell swelling, changes in muscle thickness. You can also use shear wave elastography to look at muscle stiffness, which is associated with muscle force and tension. You can take biopsies and look at disturbances to the extracellular matrix and the Z-lines within the sarcomere. That's rare, but that looks at muscle damage. You can test metabolites, like use lactate strips and test other metabolites and glycogen depletion to get an idea of the metabolic stress. You can test your creatine kinase and myoglobulin levels to see if markers of muscle damage are elevated. You can look at hormones and peptides, for example, testosterone free test, uh, cortisol, human growth hormone, insulin-like growth factor, mechanical growth factor, to see if they're elevated after an exercise. You can look at range of motion, all right, the overall range that the joint goes through, or the strain on the muscle to look at the percentage of muscle stretch. You can take a look at moment arms and pination angle. You know, this is providing numbers to functional anatomy. How much leverage does it have for this particular joint action? What percentage of the muscle fibers are useful for force production in this particular direction? You know, we can perform an exercise on force plates and look at 
you know, ground reaction force in the different directions. We can look at power, rate of force development, impulse, work. Now we can look at the force length curves of a muscle, you know, how much active tension and passive tension is generated throughout the range of motion due to that muscle's specific resting sarcomere length and moment arms, and every muscle is unique. And then we can look at exercise and look at their torque angle curves and see how do they line up with that muscle's inherent force length curve. We can utilize musculoskeletal modeling, which is complex, you know, it involves motion cameras and force plates and sometimes EMG to wear all these markers and electrodes, but that's complex biomechanical stuff. You can take biopsies in a muscle and look at the acute muscle protein synthesis. You can look at the intracellular signaling. This is rare, but you can look at things like MAPK, AKT, the mTOR pathway, you know, calcium dependent pathways, P70, S6K. And these give you an indication of, is it stimulating muscle growth? And on the performance front, we can look at PAPE or post-activation performance enhancement. If you perform this exercise before an event like a sprint or a jump, does it enhance the performance or does it not? Now I really wanna mention here, every one of these may sound amazing, but they all have massive limitations and drawbacks. In another video I filmed, I mentioned these drawbacks and it was like 40 minutes long. So I refilmed this video so I don't go on and on, but trust me on this, they all have massive limitations. One puzzle piece on his own doesn't tell you the big picture. And finally we move on to the longitudinal clues. With hypertrophy, there are a lot of tools that we can use. You can look at girth with just a tape measure, but that's not highly valid because you can gain fat and have your girth measures go up. You can use ultrasound, you can use DEXA, you can use BIA, bioelectrical impedance. You know, we have the bod pod, we have underwater weighing, we have skin fold tests, we have CT scans, we have MRI, which is the gold standard. We have biopsies to look at individual fibers. You can combine modalities like skin fold plus girth measurements, and then now you have CSA, cross-sectional area. And now we're moving towards four component models where you combine some of these together to make it even more accurate. So those are the tools used to measure hypertrophy. With strength, we can test eccentric, concentric, or isometric strength. Now we can use the force plate or an isokinetic dynamometer to look at isometric strength. Typically the force plate is used for compound movements and the dynamometer for single joint movements. We can also use the dynamometer to test eccentric or concentric strength, but the most common tests of strength are just rep maxes, you know, the one rep max, you know. What's the most weight that you can squat or bench press? You can also perform more than one rep, you know, three reps, five reps, and you can use a regression equation, you know, a, a rep calculator to estimate your one rep max. And on the performance front, with the elderly, we tend to look at ADLs. This stands for activities of daily living, right? The sit to stand. You know, you're sitting, you stand up. How long did it take you to go from a sit to stand? These are your functional everyday activities. Now in sports, we tend to look at force and power in different vectors, right? You might look at like a five or 10 meter acceleration or a top speed sprint, like 40 meters. You can do a vertical jump. You can do a horizontal or a broad jump. You can do different lateral agility tests and change of direction tests. You can test rotational power in different ways. But this guide represents all the ways that we can provide clues as to how effective effective an exercise is for different purposes, for hypertrophy, strength, and performance. Think of an exercise you're curious about, say the push-up. In a perfect world, we'd be able to take this guide and we'd have surveys, <laughs> surveys on thousands of lifters for the common sense clues, right? We'd have numerous acute mechanistic studies providing numerical data for every item listed on the guide. And we'd have numerous randomized controlled trials looking at all sorts of things <laughs> and these experiments would test those hypotheses provided by the common sense and numerical clues and hopefully they would match each other. They would marry just fine together and we'd have a really good picture of how good an exercise is for each purpose. That's just not the way it is in our field. Strength and conditioning has limited research because it's not that important. You know, obesity and cancer research is much more highly funded. These are killing people. Whether or not you lift weights or not is not gonna kill you. Lifting weights can surely enhance your quality of life and extend your lifespan, but it's not as critical of a line of research as other fields. So we're never gonna have the full puzzle. We're never gonna have a perfect puzzle telling us everything we want to know. So we fill in every puzzle piece we know, and then we fill in the gaps using our best judgment. That's how any logical, rational, scientific person would go about it. And I might take the existing puzzle pieces and form this opinion, and it could differ from another person's opinion. But if we're both scientific, we could say, yep, I see your point, you see my point, we need more research, and then we'd come to an understanding when more research is available. We can agree to disagree, but we both respect each other. But that's not what you see right now 
on social media right now. Like I said in the beginning of this video, it's the wild, wild west. And some of these gurus out there have realized that the algorithms reward polarization. They reward black and white comments. They like drama. They like black and white. They don't like gray. So when these guys bash exercises, they gain a following. And that needs to end. Every exercise is good for different reasons. And you can use this guide to determine for yourself how effective it is for your goals. All right, that's a wrap. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit like if you like this post. Please leave a comment and tell me what you think. And definitely make sure you're subscribed. Thanks for watching.